Martin. Uh, thanks for being here. And I would like to thank OWASP for giving me this opportunity to talk about serverless. It needs to have a title. So I was like thinking when I was writing this deck, like what will be a good title? And when serverless met security and the subtitle is serverless security and functions as a service. And that's the topic that we're going to talk about. Um, to give you some expectations, it will be a more high over talk. So we're going to talk about some patterns, some risks that are associated with doing, doing these types of applications. And we're going to see some bits that are by default pretty good. Some are bad, but we will get there. Um, first, the plug on myself and my company. This is the only slide that has got the logo, so people have always been worried. So I work for Vericode as a researcher. I got a background in development. I've done .NET development for quite some time. That's how I started out. I did uh, pen testing and some ethical hacking consultancy, and then I moved into Vericode. And now I'm focused on doing our static analysis research for the .NET languages. So... Um, Everything that we analyze and how we need to analyze, right? That's, that's the thing that I'm focusing on. So I'm mostly programming and I'm finding defaults that are bad or patterns that are bad and work with our engineering teams to get it implemented. If you want to talk about Veracode, come see me afterwards. Um, and when you create a deck, you want to start out with something funny. So I searched for a cartoon that illustrates the topic that we're going to talk about today. And, um, this was the best I could find. <laughs> it was a good one. It, I think it's, it illustrates the serverless e economic impact, right? You see two servers in some alley, one is smoking a cigarette. There's a banner on the left-hand side, which says like, hey, functions as a service are evil, and they probably are laid off. I don't know what happened. But um, of course, everybody knows in this room that um, when you're doing serverless and everybody talks about it, like, of course, there are services, servers that run things for you, right? So it's not that there's any hardware involved. Um, so that's the topic, and this is the agenda. We're going to talk about an overview. I'm going to briefly touch some of the subjects, like, hey, how did software evolve from a monolith, like the old-fashioned type of apps that we developed, and then moving to the serverless functions that we see uh, nowadays? It's a bit of an overview. Benefits, of course, what are the things that we get for free, and what are the downsides of doing these kinds of things? Conclusion at the end, questions and answers. If you've got something, say, well, we'll join the cube towards you and you can ask a question or you can save it till the end. I don't mind. Um, to get a sense of the audience, I'm just curious who in this room works with or works for an organization that does serverless functions as a service? Okay. Who does it? Keep your hands up. Who does it with AWS? Who does it with Azure? Two, three. Okay. Cool. Thanks. So um, it's pretty. It's pretty new. It's. It's. Is, is it something new? Right. We can all discuss about that. So let's first take a look at some software architectural pieces and then define what serverless is and talk about functions as a service. So when I started out my development career, we were usually developing a big monolithic app that was like one deployment that contained everything you need, right? So usually there was a, a UI front end. Uh, we had some data access business logic inside, and we were able to store that data inside of a database and so on. In this example, you see, which is probably some kind of web store, right? We see that the monolith contains authentication. There's functionality that allows you to do payments, calculations, and so on. So at some point, and I don't know if people have been in the same situation, like at some point we needed to separate the apps and then the layered apps came across, right? So we had the UI layer, we had the business layer and data access layer that stored it, all the abstractions, which not made it any easier by default, but that was like we needed to separate stuff because it needs to be smaller contained and focus on one piece. And and that's what uh, exactly what happened, right? And the same counts for introducing something, let's say um, an application backend, which run web services, SOAP, XML, pretty bloated. Did it perform that well? I don't think so. That was like one of the biggest problems. XML was not, uh, like if you had a big graph that you needed to push to a backend and the traffic that it produces, it was a lot. So all those protocols, when we started to moving more towards something called service orientation, right? So a services backend, it didn't work out that well. And uh, if you imagine, if you have a monolith and you want to scale how it used to be done in the old days, it was like it was deployed twice or maybe three times and there was a 
an offloader in front or at least like some, some gateway that makes sure that the requests were evenly managed by all the backends. But each monolith was deployed and there was like, um, one piece and the same counts for changes, right? That needs to be done on each thing. So that evolved over time. So we got more efficient communication protocols. We done REST, JSON came across. We can do binary messaging to backends, which, which make that a bit faster, really fast, right? So the technology was able to keep up with all the changes. And then we ended up a couple of years ago with something they call microservices, which is the middle stack. And what you see over there is that um, the application has been chopped up into smaller microservices with their own responsibilities, right? So we have something for authentication, there's a shopping cart service, payment, calculation, it's all separate containers, which of course allows you to be more agile, right? It, you can develop smaller pieces, deploy a new service, run them in, let's say, Docker containers, Kubernetes, allow them to scale with all the fancy stuff that's around it. So microservices made it a lot more manageable and also a lot more scalable. And um, the next evolution, logically, would be to move to a functions approach. And that's the thing that you see to, on the right-hand side. Still the same icons, but function, like a function, a single function, has a single responsibility and will do their work in a small amount of time. And they're stateless. I think that that's the most important definition you need to be aware of. So... If there is, let's say, a search inside the product catalog and that one has been hit really hard because it was Black Friday and everybody wants to shop that specific product. Um, if that's a function and if you run it on a platform, there's, that will scale and there's no need for you to worry about any of it, right? So that's exactly what, what we ended up being, um, functions and, and, um, how that evolved. I think it's, uh, I think it's important to realize that, like, not everything is suited to be a function as a service, like a small piece of commute, compute, because, um, if there's a long running task or there is a lot of IO involved, then it still makes sense to do a microservice that has more state retained inside of it. So that's not exclusive, right? And I think it's, it's a combination of those two that will end up having the current architectures that we see. So, seeing this evolution from monolith to microservices to functions as a service, can we create a definition of serverless and what serverless is? I think the first aspect would be like we have a full abstraction of service, right? So, using a platform like AWS, Lambda, or Azure Functions, or Google Cloud Functions, those are all abstracted layers that will take care of everything that's underneath, right? The nice thing, it's instant, it's scalable, and it's event-driven. We will get to an example later on, but what that means is that because it's it's small, it will do its work, and it's gone right away. That's the whole purpose. Uh, and it's mostly event-driven because it, it runs on something we call serverless or, or cloud. It, the nice thing that businesses see is that, um, depending on, of course, the, the vendor that you're running it, uh, there's a pay-per-use policy. So... If you have the consumption plan within Azure Functions, you will pay for the amount of compute that you use, which is pretty nice, right? As a business, you know exactly like, hey, um, once a year we will have uh, a high load and that's the only compute that you will pay for, right? It's pretty, it's, it's, a, it's a good business case and it can be developed quickly and so on. Um, the last quote is done by Eric Peterson from Cloud Zero at QCon. He says like, he thinks, he thinks that serverless is a word that we should get rid of because we're just talking about the cloud and the best analogy will be like cloud is the operating system and serverless is its native code. So it's one of the key components that you need in order to um, do the thing. If we then quickly take a peek at one of the, uh, one of the, this is like a, a responsibility pictures of where, uh, where your own responsibilities are. And what you see in the green is the thing that you need to do yourself. The blue is done by the, um, um, by the cloud provider. I should have put that on the bottom of the slide. But you will see, like, once you end up from infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, serverless is only dealing with the application, right? And SaaS, of course, is more like a SharePoint type of thing. You just configure and use it. That's the difference. But with serverless, you're only worried about the application. And there's no need to worry about infrastructure. So if we then see uh, functions as a service, it's not serverless. That's usually what uh, everybody says. And this is almost like... um a definition, if you start out doing a presentation talking about cyber, I think this, this is similar, right? Everybody has his own definition and has his own thing. But I think it's important to know that functions as a service is not serverless itself. It's one of the key building blocks. 
as I said, it's a small piece of compute which is stateless and inferior, meaning that they will run short. That should be one of the goals. It has a single responsibility. That should be a function. And it's scalable and event-driven. So with that said, let's dig into one of the, one, one example. This is a, a, uh, an application. It's a demo app that's written uh, in Azure Functions. It's on GitHub. Um, all the patterns that I talk about will all be applicable on every cloud vendor, right? So it's not necessarily only tied to, to Azure. What we see over here is the, the lightning bolts are the functions that execute. You see that there's an IoT hub that delivers data. There's a things network that delivers data. There are queues inside this whole system, this whole architecture, table storage. And I think this is a nice illustration of what serverless is mostly used for, right? So functions are stateless. They store data in queues, and queues are also part of the cloud operating system, right? They store data. Uh, a queue gets a message. A, a function will do its compute instantly because that's the trigger, right? That's the event. And it will write back data to another queue or to another table storage. So in this case, the example is a waste management system. It deals with IoT, so sensors that are inside the containers that will indicate how full the container is. It will take an account like, hey, temperatures are rising the next couple of weeks, so it might make sense to empty this container right now. That, that's the whole use case behind this. But I think this is the nice illustration of how serverless and functions are being used. Um, if you're interested in more about these type of architectures, you search search for iRobots architecture like the vacuums, the Roombas that uh, that that do the autono autonomous uh, thing in your house. Uh, they all run on AWS Lambdas, like every data thing that the vacuum does, like creating a map of your living room and then share it with them. It's all done with AWS Lambda, and IoT is a best fit for this, and it will grow and. As I said, like these are just functions that store data and uh, will use it, and it's scalable, right? So each function, once there is a queue filled up with more messages, it can scale up and it will do the processing more quickly. So it's all efficient. So talked a lot about concepts, talked a lot about architectures and software and um, some basics. So what are then the security benefits of doing this? One big benefit, as we saw earlier with that uh, responsibility matrix, is like the, the servers and all the underlying infrastructure is all managed by the vendors. So let's say a new zero day here hits us, uh, like Heartbleed or anything that's low level. One moment somebody could run your function on a server that's vulnerable, but the next run might be on a new one that's already fully patched, right? And if it's happening overnight, then you might even notice that the patches has happened, right? There's not anything you need to worry about. And I think we can assume that most of the vendors like AWS or Microsoft or Google do a pretty good job at keeping an eye on that, like what's been published, what type of updates they need to um, publish on the on the machines, the red teams, the blue teams involved with all of it. it. I think we should definitely trust that. Would that mean that if there's no server, there's nothing to compromise? And that's, of course, not completely true because there's still an application that runs. There's still data being stored, right? And a nice talk is done by Rich Jones at CCC, I think already two years ago. And he's talking about gone in 60 milliseconds. And it has to do with exfiltrating and pen testing these types of functions. He has got some good insights on how he deals with that with AWS. He's also a guy that I think he developed Zappa, which is a serverless framework, which runs on Python, I believe. But he knows his stuff and he shares on like what are the, what are the glitches? And is it totally impossible? Of course it's not, right? So there's still, um, things to learn from that. Nice talk. All the talks that I'm referring to, the end slide will have links, so don't worry about that. Could we then say that denial of service is mitigated? Is it? Um, I think from network perspective, we can probably assume, like say, that the cloud vendor does a pretty good job on offloading network traffic if there's a lot. Still, it will be hard for them, but hey, it's possible. Um, Keep in mind that the function, if it's exposed throughout an API gateway to external services, if I can just push a lot of messages to that API, it still needs to respond. And um, the cloud vendor will be just happy because as long as you take that compute, you will pay for it. So it's more like a denial of wallet at the end, like how much can you pay for it? And it's not necessarily a denial of service. Um, once you get involved, like, hey, I want to limit the amount of processing I'm doing, then you're reintroducing the problem again, right? You're still having a denial of service because if you limit it and you stop processing, then 
that, that's the same issue. So lower level denial of service is good, but still, if there's an API endpoint exposed and uh, it's it's badly architectured and there's a lot of stuff happening and you can probably imagine that there will still be starvation, at least from the money that's been spent or or some other case, right? So the next thing I think we need to be aware about is the attack surface. So if we have the analogy of the big monolith we saw earlier, the, the box that's self-contained, but with functions, you smudge out your whole application architecture over the platform that you're using. Every function will be deployed someplace. You don't know where it will be running. Yes, there are plans, like let's say, I think with Azure, you can have an app service that will be more contained, but still, you should assume that you don't know where everything is running. Um, it introduces a lot of complexity, right? So um, with all the moving parts that make up the whole system, as we saw earlier with that uh, with that waste management system, at some point, an event happens and it has outcome. Uh, we want to keep track of that. And we need to be aware of there's an in inner and outer attack surface. So if we get back to the picture, in this case, we see that this system accepts data from different inputs, which is the weather table or the IoT or the IoT hub or the other uh, things network, right? That's an input source. That's an attack surface. There are queues internally, right? So yeah, you might have locked down the fact that a function is limited to communicate to a queue, but who knows if that single function gets compromised and somebody still has got the ability to pivot further, right? Maybe a queue was badly configured and is still exposed to the outside world. That can happen, especially if, let's say, other third parties have got access to that system, right? You want to integrate, you want to connect with everybody. That's also a thing. So be aware that there's an external thing, which usually can probably be secured in a pretty good way if you use an API gateway from one of the vendors that will do authentication, authorization, that will take care of it. But there's more to it because the application itself runs on a platform. It's run. You don't know where, you don't know when. And that makes it hard to keep track of also. And that keeps, gets me to the next, to the next point. Similar to the complexity of the app itself, it's really hard to keep track of what exactly is happening. So if you're developing these kinds of systems, it makes sense that you have some kind of logging structure uh, in, inside the app that will allow you to correlate events that happened and see what type of um, business flow it does. Um, I think a question everybody needs to ask themselves if they're doing this, like, what are you monitoring? Are you monitoring a single function instance? If we have a big system, that, that single function doesn't tell anything about the whole system and how it's acting. So it makes more sense to keep an eye on um, functions like, hey, uh, what's the normal load that I get? The amount of data producers like this queue right now is getting a lot of data. Does it make sense, right? That Those kinds of things, those are questions need to be answered. And if, uh, let's say, you've got a blue team internally that helps out like monitoring this, then that application needs to tell that, like, this is the anomaly. These are the things that we're interested in. So I think with the complexity and with the platform, you need to be aware that logging is a key thing to do, right? Um, and yes, the vendors usually have the nice solution for this, but then you will have a heavy load of data and then yeah, you need to interpret that, right? So it's, it's, it's hard and it makes sense to really, um, make sure that you log the things that are essential for the app and for the organization. And now we end up, <clears throat> sorry, of course, at the point where OWASP is all about, um, talked about a lot about platforms, about stuff, running, queues, and so on. Still, there's a piece of code that will be developed, which is the function. Um, and if we look at AWS and also at Azure Functions, the technologies that can be used is, is a variant of a lot, right? So AWS has got a lot of stacks you can just use. Azure Functions uh, with their latest runtime, .NET, JS, I think that's it. Um, and they will get more. But the old-fashioned stuff is still around. There's still input coming from a source, a queue, a HTTP, a, a HTTP request from an API gateway. We still need to make sure that we do the right things with sanitization of our data, doing uh, like no dynamic SQL, right? It's all uh, pretty straightforward. And, and that still counts, right? And what about third-party libraries? I think this might even be most important. I didn't want to throw in the slide with the iceberg that you see like the small tip just at the surface and then the big blob underneath. I'm just going to stick with these, uh, with these, uh, text lines. Um, 
I think it's important to, un- to understand that if you're d- developing a platform on top of an SDK, there's always a code base underneath that, which of course helps out to do the job, but there's more code and code has got problems and vulnerabilities. So if you develop an Azure function in C Sharp in a new runtime and you have 10, ten lines of the hello world, um, by default, it has no, uh, cross that scripting issues because the encoding is done right. But if you then return it, then keep in mind there's 50,000 lines of code for the host itself. And one of the libraries that has been used by every .NET project that I know is Newton soft JSON, right? So for the JSON, the serialization that got, that has got 120 K lines. So there's a lot of code running behind it, right? Yes. It's from developer perspective. It's easy to create a service. It's easy to deploy. You just pull in the dependencies, which in uh, most of the case for .NET come from NuGet, right? So you will just compose if you do a .NET core uh, app, it will get all the dependencies that it needs. Um, and there's a lot more. And those packages become vulnerable. There is um, stuff that might go wrong. Even Newtonsoft had one issue with the configuration, like uh, type information with serialization, and we know that that ends up being RCE, right? So, um, yeah, if things happen. Third-party libraries, also keep in mind that once you use one third-party libraries, you usually have a whole dependency graph of libraries that you pull in. It's not a single thing. There's a lot more underneath um, that you pull in. And it's not unseen that there are published packages that are malicious or compromised with bad intent. And we saw that earlier this week. And this is, of course, related to, to, to JavaScript, like the NPM thing that happened. And I was reading through it, and I saw like, oh, 2 million downloads. But it was 2 million downloads weekly. I said, that, that's a lot. And um, somebody, um, you probably have heard the story, but as far as I'm aware, it has to do with uh, a stale library. Nobody developed it. Somebody got involved. This is like, I want to help out. And he published a version that had um, code that will uh, target Bitcoin wallets to steal the keys inside of it. But it has 2 million installs a week, and there are 5,000 packages that depend on this single thing. Um, so as an organization, like pulling in third-party libraries, I think it makes sense to curate that and make sure that you're aware of what type of vulnerabilities are used by a function or by any app, of course, within the organization. And then make sure that you can act on these kinds of instances that that stuff happens. Because this will just happen. There's nothing like we can do about it. We need to act on it and make sure that we do the right thing. So... Talking about libraries right now, of course, the code, when we saw the picture earlier, um, aside from the, the application code, the, the logic that executes, we also need to store secrets. And secrets meaning like, hey, this function needs to access this queue. So it needs to have some kind of authentication, like a connection string that it uses. Um, you need to make sure that you use like you, you store them. Most of those examples you will see, they will store them in the environment variables. I'm not sure if that's the right uh, way to go. I think it would be good to make sure that you use platform-specific services. So for Azure, that would mean Azure Key Vault that will do encryption on a specific endpoint and that will help out getting um, the function to fetch the secret once it's needed. Right. So the, the, the function itself, uh, there are different patterns. You can still put them in an environment variable, but um, it, it's hard. This should be part of the whole drill that you're doing. Make sure that uh, a function, when it gets deployed, gets its, its secrets that it needs, the connection strings. Um, and one good talk on this is Secrets at Scale, which is done by Ian Hacken from Netflix, and he's done it at Enigma, I think, two years ago. Um, he talks about how they do it at Netflix and how hard it is to um, have something scale and then some service has an identity, it needs to fetch uh, the secrets that it needs in order to run. It's a good talk. You should definitely watch it if you're interested in finding out more about this. So we have secrets, but like we had code that executes and we have data that gets stored, right? And we're still responsible for um, for storing our own data, or at least like we need to make sure that we protect the data in the best way possible. It needs to be done in transit and as the rest, right? So most of the connections that you make are TLS-based or certificates. And if you use, let's say, table storage or Azure uh, queues, then um, by default, it will have encryption turned on. And I think uh, in the past, you need to explicitly turn it on, but right now it's just a default when you create a new resource, which is good. People still are worried about, okay, but then 
a Microsoft or a Google or AWS manages my keys. And that's not necessarily true because you can provide your own keys in order for the service to do its thing. So that's also good. So that's all, all sorted out. And it's done transparently by the vendors, which is good. I think it's also uh, good to consider maybe doing client-side encryption at some point within your system, right? So take that whole picture uh, where data is in transit. You know that it, that has some real sensitive data. Don't rely on the infrastructure being secure, but also make sure that you do encryption on those elements. And client-side encryption, if you search for it on at least the Microsoft documentation, you will find some good examples on how you can do that. Um, another thing, probably open door, make sure that you apply least privilege. And what I mean by that is that least privilege needs to be applicable on each function. So if a function needs to just write a single message out to an, a queue, why do you give it access to everything? And all the examples that you see right now, even published by the big vendors themselves, they don't take in account any of this, right? It's almost the equivalent of um, the, the monolith I talked about earlier, there's a database SQL Server behind it and it runs in SA mode. And once there's an injection possible, then you can see what happens, right? This is exactly the same. Like, why should you give more rights to that single function? It has got one purpose, right? That's one of the goals of, of functions as a service. So make sure that it only gets the rights that it needs. And another thing, because there's a lot of um, functions and a lot of stuff happening, it makes sense to review and audit those privileges and make sure that, hey, if something isn't used that long, remove it, right? Automate that. Make sure that you're aware of um, how that works out for your system. And the same goes, this is this, the picture, right? So least privilege, I mean, uh, access to a queue, that's the only thing it needs. Access to a table storage, maybe to read, right? Then give it that access, right? Nothing more, nothing less. The same counts for um, authentication authorization. And I know that this slide is pretty basic because it has one line that says like a leverage the platform service. But the API gateways, as I talked about, are pretty good at their job and make sure that you leverage those. Um, even if you see, let's say, somebody from AWS talking about uh, serverless and risks. Yeah, there's he, he put it the other way around. He says like, yeah, there's a lot of complexity. You've got a function, but... Keep in mind that a platform, if you use it in the right way, can secure that function as a whole, which kind of makes sense. But you need to make sure how to leverage those services and do the right thing. And that's one of the key things, right? Um, so make sure that you leverage those type of, of, of services. Um, and when we develop software, of course, um, we're still talking about a supply chain and uh, stuff that gets developed. And if we're um, doing a more type of like quick release cycle, we want to automate as much as possible. I think that makes sense to focus uh, to focus on that, right? So make sure that you're um, automating everything in the best way possible because that will allow you to anticipate on changes if there needs to be something like a third party library uh, has got a problem. It should be just a matter of pushing a button and hey, everything is automated and is deployed, right? Deployment as code um, still also becomes a target, right? Because it's an artifact that you use to uh, develop your software. Um, supply chain attacks, it's not been unseen, right? The NPM thing is a basic thing of a supply chain that gets attacked because of the stale development and somebody else who just uh, coincidentally said like, hey, I want to help out. I'm going to put some extra stuff in it. So those things happen. And the same thing counts for making sure that you have got separate environments, right? Even you've seen the pictures, a lot of complexity. If there's a big system, make sure that you have got separate stages that you can still test those things in. There's no cross-cutting things. The same counts with um, uh, with all the access rights and the least privilege. There were some talks, uh, the one that uh, Eric Peterson talked at QCon. You should definitely watch it if you're interested. He talks about access right and least privilege. And he says, like, I haven't audited a AWS environment which didn't have an asterisk right set to some resource, right? And it also has to do, let's say, with the defaults. I believe they've changed it. But still stuff happens. And once um, those access right has been given, it will be pretty hard to maybe revert that to something which is lower access, right? So make sure that you create separate environments 
and deal with those as separate things and don't have any cross-cutting concerns on that. So with that said, I'm going to recap um, some of the things and I want to give you some takeaways on what I think is important. Um, first of all, I think it's pretty cool seeing serverless being involved and it's pretty, it's, 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 it's new, like, like the buzzword type of thing that they're doing. If you're watching the AWS event that's being held right now, I think today, last day or last yesterday, maybe uh, there's a lot of, uh, things that happen on development, like, uh, databases can even scale faster. It's all moving to, into that direction. For development, it's also pretty easy. You can create a function you just deployed and it, and it works. But that's also one of the downsides, um, of the whole thing because it will be hard for an organization. Let's say if developers within your organization are allowed to do this, how can you keep track of what they're deploying, where, what are the, the, the libraries that they're using, like, like the whole thing that we talked about earlier. So it's easy to create. It's hard to keep track of. And I think we should be aware of that. And I also think that as the security industry, we should be able to enable the developers to do the right thing by giving them the right tools and don't push them back in the stuff that they're doing because that will make everybody unhappy. Uh, and that's not how it's supposed to be, in my opinion, also. I mentioned threat modeling. Yeah, it's, it's, of course, the whole life cycle needs to be implemented. It needs to be a good fit for the business that you're working in. But I think it makes sense to analyze the risks based on the bigger picture you saw earlier. And make sure that you have comp compatibilization of the functions itself treated as a single app that gets deployed with its own responsibilities. I think, uh, that's one of the key things. Make sure that monitoring and logging is something that you um, take into account and make sure that you are able to make sense out of what's happening, right? The whole business case. It's not something that you're interested in, like, hey, this function has failed. No, it's the whole picture, like, hey, the load of the system, how it scales, and so on. And be aware that you need to automate the, as much as possible. I almost wanted to say something else, but I'm not going to do that. But need to automate it in all ways in order to make sure that you're able to deliver fast and to anticipate changes because that's just how it works. So with that said, we're going to throw the cube into the audience <laughs> if needed. So apparently this is, <laughs> this is the part where you're talking to. Any any questions? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> oh. oh, pretty good. You don't. <laughs> Hi. So, just one small question. Um, you started with the wallet protection. Basically, we there you talked about DDoS protection. Um, so, AWS delivers uh, EDOS protection in the okay. sense that. So, how does that work? Where does it end? What do you mean? Like, I think it, it all depends on, like, you need to determine if the call that has been done has got malicious intent or is something that you just should just process, right? And that's a bit ambiguous. And that also depends on, um, if there's a payload that's pretty obvious, I think, uh, that might be wrong, then that probably will do a good job if something, uh, is, is maybe try to do some type confusion. I don't know, like, the exact example you're referring to. But, um, I still think that um, it all depends on the internal message and uh, how does that message then evolve over the whole architecture, right? How much data does it produce? Like that's also a risk because the more data it produces, right? So yes, like those type of services that everybody should use them and they will do a good job. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that that's not the case, but uh, there's still an application that's exposed. So that will be the next thing to, to, to DOS, right? So, well, for uh, AWS Shield, if you have uh, build protection enabled, for instance, yeah, um, what is the effectiveness of that? So, I'm not that AWS guy that knows all the details about all the services. Um, I'm sorry. So, maybe um, I like at Veracode we run a lot on AWS. So, if you're really interested in knowing, I can con I can get you in contact with the guy that's responsible for us for doing that, if you want. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Watch your back in the front. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you should turn around the camera. That's <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 
Sorry. Uh, thanks for this uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering, you um, were looking at um, authorization authentication. That means yeah. uh, um, identity management. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of development in identity management uh, as cloud service, et cetera, et cetera. And this machine-to-machine communication. Yeah. Do you see new development in uh, required functionality from these products if we go to this uh, fast model? So I know that every... Not sure if I can can answer it. I know that every cloud vendor will try to keep up with what the rest is doing in that same space, right? Because um, like one downside of doing functions and and doing a specific vendor, then you always have that vendor lock in on that platform, right? So the things that I'm talking about are general patterns. But once you have chosen for AWS or Azure, it will be hard to move out that space, right? Right. Um, Have I seen... Um, any of those. To be honest, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think, um, they probably will evolve, um, identities like in, in Azure, there's app identities, which is pretty important that identifies a function as an identity that, that you can then use to do some uh, authorization later on in the chain, right? So mm-hmm. that, that makes sense. And AWS probably has got similar things. So, um, I'm not sure what they even published at re-event two days ago, right? That's, that's the, that's the quick thing. And that's also one of the problems. You can publish a lot of services and have a lot of things available, but how do you expect organizations and developers to keep up with all the latest bits? Like, I don't even know that, right? So that's, that's tough for sure. Right. So I'm sorry. I hope I answered your question, but. It's um, yeah. Well, I think there are some, maybe new challenges up the road. Right? I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe. I think indeed we can conclude maybe there are new challenges or more oh, yeah, challenges for, sure. for, for uh, sure. identity management. And that's also nice because yeah. this, qu- this space moves so quick, then there will be adoption. Right. Hopefully, like it will change this really quick, right? So, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? In the front. <laughs> the cube needs to go down. <laughs> if not. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Enjoy, Jay.